hi roger thanks for coming on 21 towers thanks for having me sandeep uh, so roger you are a ypo member as well so so which chapter are you a mem- member of uh, i'm a member of ypo seal story which is the southeast asia chapter and i've also been yeah. a member of uh, ypo pacific rim as well okay and i think we found each other because you had posted about crypto lock in one of ipo's blockchain group and that's how we found each other and i've never met you so this is the first time we're getting to know each other so tell us a little bit about your background yeah no thanks for reaching out um a little bit about my background is most of my actual uh post college professional career was spent in china so it's one of the earliest uh folks in fintech in china i i joined a early stage company called Credities I started the online division called Erandai uh Erandai was a portion of the company that was one of the first fintechs in China to go public on the NYC and uh subsequent to that I had a fintech for 8 years in China which I grew to about 200 people um we had a JV with a private wealth management partner we were dealing with the government um it was an online peer to asset management or peer to peer lending platform in China and um yeah we grew to about 2 billion rmb of assets under management and then due to the regulatory changes in China we exited that in 2018 and and 18 um subsequent to that um uh, you know i i got in i, I we can go into this, but i got to i got involved in the bitcoin um community while i was in China being fintech and you get a bit of a you touch base on central banks and you know what cryptocurrency is and why it exists and and things like that um and the subsequent to that i i started policy dark um uh, which is an insurtech insurance platform as a service uh we're servicing uh carriers and insurtechs both in asia and in in the us region and yeah and and now we started crypto lock um not too long ago about 6 7 months ago and that was due to cyber insurers uh basically dealing with a lot of ransomware being paid in bitcoin and then you know when they when we were pitching them on the policy dark service you know my co-founder started one of the largest uh the largest bitcoin exchange in taiwan called mycoin and also subsequent had a blockchain analytics business called bloxia so uh yeah we <laughs> they looked at us and said oh you guys could maybe understand what's going on here and the problems we're trying to solve so we spent the better part of last year um you know kind of deep diving uh into the whole not only cyber insurance but also um with you know what's happening in bitcoin ransomware recovery um legal regulatory changes that are happening in the crypto space and of course i want to deep dive into that but before we do that what was your exposure to bitcoin happen like which year was it uh, what happened uh, were you skeptical initially yeah and so you know it was, it was funny one of my you know when i first read about it i thought this is amazing because you know we we actually wanted to do when i so when i finished uh, my masters at stanford you know there was an idea which we wanted to do which was actually transfer wise which was to this intermediate uh, currency remittances basically and then i saw zopa lending club uh, kiva and then that was a light bulb that flashed um in 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 my mind in terms of you know this intermediating the banking industry basically right as the question is you know what is what is a bank a bank is where you put money and where you get money at the end of the day it's a black box you don't know when you put the money in you don't know where it goes etc etc and then at the same time there was bitcoin and we saw i saw the price at $80 and then it went to $250 and then it went to $1000 i didn't dip my toes in um Im- immediately right and uh, regrettably basically uh but you know one of my angel investors my previous company uh he invested you know he was friends with another friend of mine in beijing who um came from the kyc realm and then became the head of compliance for OK Coin which at that time became the largest uh Bitcoin exchange in China right so you know we had long conversations um and then ultimately when he left to start a new business we actually also angel invested 
in the new business as well. But um, through him, I got to, you know, I was going to Bitcoin mining um, conferences back then before Bitmain became like the giant juggernaut it is. Um, you know, we went to Bitcoin mining conferences where you see all these different ASICs. <laughs> Trying to ask them, hey, if I buy this now, how much energy, you know, what's my ROI going to be, and such and um, such and so forth. And then, uh, and then, you know, and then, and then, so I kept going to Bitcoin informal Bitcoin meetups, and um, you know, then the whole Bitcoin Cash versus Bitcoin uh, because of Bitmain, the whole Bitcoin Cash versus uh, Bitcoin ma maximalism came up, the whole Roger Ver thing, and. So it was, it was extremely like exciting thing. Then the whole ICO craze came up in China, where so many companies and I and <laughs> and ashamedly and self admittedly I was actually wanting to launch an an ICO at that time. And then uh, luckily I did not. Luckily I did not. Otherwise I, I would not be speaking to you right now. So you know when you're following all the different types of <laughs> regulatory kind of um, you know. You know, I, I called regulatory jujitsu, where but you know China was the largest trading volume for Bitcoin at a stage, and then it wasn't. And you know, but it's amazing how resilient the market is and how resilient, um, how how resilient things have changed. I remember talking to the folks at Bitmain and saying like the best thing you could do is actually reincorporate your business outside of China. <laughs> so, so it was. You know, and and then you know, at at, at a stage, I, I sincerely believed Bitmain was probably the most profitable company in China for one year, and then they had grand ambitions to like list on the Hong Kong Stock Exchange and X, Y, and Z, right? So, um, you know, I haven't, admittedly, I've been passively investing in in the industry, but I haven't, um, you know, I haven't, I, I never did anything in terms of um, starting. You know, an altcoin or or doing doing some, something like that, and we can go into some. So, crypto lock essentially is a is um we it's, it's it's a tools and services provider for the industry. You know, we're not taking any principal risk on any type of um uh, currency. But you know, uh, frankly speaking, uh, I've you know a lot of my YPO buddies are always asking me where's the price going, where's it going. I said, you know, look, if you believe the coin's going to be one million dollars a coin, what the fuck does it, you know, excuse my French, huh? what, what does it matter that it's going to be twenty thousand today or sixty thousand tomorrow, right? If you think in ten years it's going to be a million dollars a coin, none of this really matters. The only question you should be thinking is that if it is a million dollars a coin, then how does the world look like? Because <laughs> the world might not look like a a really great place. It might look like Zimbabwe uh, times times twenty, right? So, you know, these are. I think those are the more overarching, more important questions. And so, because you were in China and involved in the Chinese, you know, fintech space, and then of course China banned Bitcoin and you know banned first the exchange activity, and then what? How did what did you feel like? Do you feel like China has? Really lost an opportunity. I, I I think they lost a massive opportunity. You know they you know I I think um, basically they controlled over fifty percent of the mining at a stage in China was controlled in China, right? So if they actually you know the the central um, the CBRC obviously had a had an agenda to promote the RMB and they didn't want an alternative to to the RMB, so they wanted to create their own digital yen. But you know, if, <laughs> if you speak some to some of the Russians in China at these at these exchange at these meetups, they'll be like, "Look, if you put if you put um, you know, I'm not you know, this is not a political thing or etc. But if you put like when we were talking about altcoins, it's like, look, if you put shit on a blockchain, it is still shit, right? So you know, they could have controlled the entire cryptocurrency market if you you know. And I think when they banned and they forced the miners to move out of China. You know, it was a massive, massive lost opportunity, right? And that was where the U.S. is really falling behind. I remember going to um, fintech meetups or conferences in China in the early days where Ripple had just started. And, you know, a lot of the guys, a lot of the crypto guys were coming to Shanghai, Beijing, etc., to basically see how to get more and more involved and bringing more money to China at the, at the end of the day. So I think it's as... It's a, it's a very paranoid move by the Chinese government. It's definitely the wrong move on the greater 
agenda for China for China hegemony at the end of the day. And you know, frankly speaking, it's it's it's, it's, it's like a communist philosophy that basically has you know has shot themselves in the foot, right? If like you if you control over not only do you control over fifty percent of the mining, but over fifty percent of the trade, you control the currency, right? So you you're already hedged against your own currency in case your own currency fails, right? So uh, you know I, I I just did not believe it, um, but I I will say that in my dealings with the CBRC and the PBOC, they are extremely extremely smart people, you know you know so um, as you can imagine, of course you're know, right, you know so. And what I always found frustrating, especially when, when running a fintech there, was that you would be dealing with extremely smart people who knew what they knew needed to do and knew how to regulate it. But then uh, what you have in China is uh, they call it the FAGAWE, which is the Economic Planning Commission, which basically <laughs> is a political structure that tells the CBRC and PBOC what to do. So it really trumps, you know, like any smart, you know, greater good thinking. For, and puts politics in, in front uh, at the end of the day, and puts you know CCP uh, hegemony and rule at the end of the day of what's what's the greater good for the country is. It's uh, actually pretty surprising the similarity of our experiences, you with China, and me with India. Because when I was running um, the uh, you know crypto exchange in India, I was at the forefront of meeting government um, all the time, especially in 2017, 2018. And exactly the way you feel, yeah. I was impressed <clears throat> with their knowledge. They were extremely smart people at the front end, the bureaucrats, but they just had oh, this yeah. top end policy, yeah. which was to protect, uh, you know, uh, capital outflows. Uh, and it was a misdirected thought that uh, cryptocurrencies and Bitcoin uh, would hamper that or would be a danger to that. And India, of course, did not have any uh, control over the currency. They just did not allow it. To happen china had it and then you know unfortunately lost it yeah. we had an opportunity uh to you know get involved or have a bigger market share and we totally lost it and it is it, it is terrible i mean as some uh, you of course want good things from the country that you've come from and you just feel like it's a massive lost opportunity which the country does not realize um you also so so it's clear that you've been involved in bitcoin since a very long time because you're talking about a price which was i think uh before it was 2012, 2013, at least you've got exposed to it. And then you spoke about other cryptocurrencies and the altcoin boom and stuff. What's your current state of thinking of Bitcoin versus altcoins? Are you a Bitcoin maximalist? Uh, yeah, you know, look, at, at the end of the day, is I, I am mostly a Bitcoin maximalist and most of my kind of wealth is in Bitcoin. Um, and so, you know, I, I do that with my things. But like, it's, you know, I love, I love innovation. I love what's happening, you know, in terms of, I think people always, you know, in terms of new technology, people always underestimate the task of getting mass adoption on something. So, you know, if you are trying to start a competing thing, it's detracting away from the things that are already working or getting mass adoption, right? So, uh, you know, nothing against Ethereum, nothing against like, um, you know, or Polkadot or any of the all the major altcoins and and or you know things like that. But ultimately, as an underlying, as an underlying kind of store of value or whatever you want to call it or payment currency etc you know I, I think bitcoin you know people actually always underestimate that it was a social movement it was a grassroots movement you know if you want to replicate it it's almost like there's so many miracles that happened to to make bitcoin get to the to the point it is today that you know it's not it's like even if you had the smartest people in the world to redo that that's <laughs> it wouldn't it, there's a strong chance that wouldn't be able to be replicated, right? So, you know, I do understand the whole kind of like tech envy or whatever, and it's outdated, it's a dinosaur and blah, 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 but it's stable, it works, it does what it does. And, you know, you're never going to question a mining machine. And, you know, I, I understand like the criticisms of proof of work, but like proof of work is one of the best, you know, concepts or whatever that, humanity has ever come up with people really underestimate proof of work yeah and it's proof of work what we do in every other aspect it's a little bit more abstract and it's a little bit more direct over here so i think it takes time for people to wrap their heads uh, around it and especially because we yeah. don't have any analogies 
uh, to explain proof of work before gold and you know in gold yeah so yeah. i understand but so yeah you know uh, but so what's the problem that when you were in policy doc the your clients were facing which inspired you to st start crypto lock as a solution you know yeah so so, so it's very interesting um you know we so what i did is post china um you know, I, I was both in lending and asset management, fintechs and, and things like that. And, um, and I, you know, I, th I think maybe I might be speaking for you, but similar to you, I did not want to deal with regulators anymore because it's, you, you know, they tell you one thing, they do another thing at the end of the day. So, so then we, I said, okay, let's start a boring, you know, I've been in fintech uh, since 2008, 2009. And I was like, I was a bit bored of fintech. So I thought, hey, insurance is the next uh, is, is is the next kind of you know blue ocean blue wave, and I couldn't you know I had a bad leg uh, accident that broke my leg to be a fibia, and I was just dealing with my insurer and it was probably one of the worst experiences I've ever dealt with in my life, where I had to crutch to the printer, change invoices, make sure the I's are dotted and the T's are crossed, and. Uh, I thought, why, why is insurance not modern? And basically, that's where we thought, okay, why don't we help modernize insurers, right? So, you know, like I'm still sending these mass long chains of emails and helping them. You're doing the, the job of the claims adjuster. So that, that's what we built is we, we built a, an API for a totally modular um, policy administration platform for insurers. And this is but in the big problem in, in, in insurtech is... This is policy doc. The big problem in, in insurance um, is obviously number A is like, you know, any investor, any entrepreneur in the space will say it's the sales cycle. And it's that kind of, um, it's inertia. It's, a, it's, it's not the willingness to change type of, uh, type of mentality. Uh, so we had to overcome that. And so we, we got our first traction and most of our traction to this day is in cyber insurance uh, because Cyber risks are, are continuously evolving. Um, the risks are changing. The coverages are changing. The way it's being underwritten, the data sources they need are, are constantly being updated. You know, payments, monitoring, all that. And all that data to underwrite cyber risk is extremely valuable for an insurer. So that's where our platform for PolicyDark really sang, is that we've got this whole modern API first you know, architecture that could connect to any of your data sources, any of your underwriting tools, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and then, so, you know, working with these guys, uh, you know, they like looked more at our team and they said, Hey, you know, your co you know, your, you know, um, Danny and my current CTO as well, like, Hey, you guys understand blockchain analytics because they started one of the first blockchain analytics businesses called Bloxia, which was, uh, sold to a Russian Canadian listed company and also started also a Bitcoin exchange uh, before in Taiwan, they said, Hey, well, you know, a lot of the ransomware that is being paid is being paid in Bitcoin. And, you know, we're looking at ways to, um, you know, to streamline this, this, this kind of um, service for our clients and X, Y, and Z. So cut a long story short, they put us in touch with all these, um, so the, the newer blockchain analytics businesses today, the, you know, the, the Merkle sciences, the, the chain analysis, et cetera, et cetera, of the world, um, a lot of the top global law firms, of the top people in ransomware, negotiation, asset recovery, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and also looking at different types of crypto policies, uh, insurance policies, and, and, and such and so forth. So we, we spoke with a lot of global experts um, in the space. And basically, that became the genesis of CryptoLock. And, and ultimately, the basic insight is that, you know, I, I went around the world for six months last month, uh, last year, asking people, so what do you do? What happens when your crypto gets lost? And basically, everyone <laughs> says, you know, I don't know. I cry. I go to the corner. I get in the fetal position. You know, I, you know. Uh, it's, it's, you know, so there's a lot of technology for pre-breach in terms of, you know, your, you know, MPCs, multi-sig, this, that, et cetera, et cetera. But also what we, we see a lot of is there's a lot of internal fraud and your, comp 
you know, your compliance team is your biggest biggest asset. They're expensive. They're your biggest asset or they're your biggest liability. Now, just take FDX for an example, right? They file for bankruptcy and one week later, $1.1 billion goes missing. And they have so-called, they can afford all the top security protocols in the industry. <laughs> Did they follow any of them? Probably not, right? So, um, you know, that's, that's and, and also people, you know, people think, you know, I guess, you know, probably not in the YPO community and stuff, but people think the, the average Joe thinks crypto sounds cryptic, but crypto is cryptography and it's on a blockchain. So a blockchain is 100% transparent. So I, I tell folks like, look, you know, I, not, <laughs> not that I, you know, advise people or whatever on, on this, like if you ever wanted to, you know, launder money or do anything like that, don't use crypto, don't use cryptocurrency. It's 100% trace, traceable. And the amount of innovation that's happened in, um, in, in um, blockchain analytics and things like that is, is very sophisticated. So it's 100% going to be traced to where, you know, you, you where it's even through mixes and tornado cash and all, all those things like that. If you've got a sophisticated forensic sky, you know, it's going to be found, right? Now, the thing is, even though it's found, um, this, you know, as you know, the financial services world is a, you know, is a who me too, right? So the top law firms will only trust the top type of um, guys or forensics teams and the top, you know, uh, kind of asset recovery guys will only trust the top, <laughs> you know, forensics teams and, and X, Y, and Z. So all the insurers will also subrogate or, um, you know, use vendors that they trust, right? So even if you've got two people, you know, average Joe here and, you know, well-branded um, forensics team here, if average Joe comes up with the same evidence, uh, it's, not e it's not easily going to be trusted. So, so that's where we connect all the dots. We bring the best of the best for you to get all the forensics, get all the, um, you know, uh, uh, law firm, top law firms, uh, top folks in the industry to basically um, understand the case, understand what's happened and help you in the recovery, basically. This is super interesting. I think with the background that you have with PolicyDoc and, you know, with the uh, blockchain analysis company that your co-founder created, you're kind of at the perfect point to understand this space and launch CryptoLock. Uh, when you went around the world talking to people of what they do, um, if they lose their cryptocurrency, um, and you kind of maybe spoke about CryptoLock or offered your services, is there a willingness? Because it's one of those things where you feel like it cannot happen to you. And so should I bother with an insurance product like CryptoLock? So, you know, you, you would be amazingly surprised at the different stories, uh, even amongst YPOs, right? That a lot of the so-called experts and things, you know, when I talk about in confidential, like our, my services, you know, a lot of them like, I wish I knew you eight months ago because we had, you know, an eight or five or six million dollar hack, right? And, you know, we're dealing with the authorities and we're dealing with the FBI. But at the same time, if you deal with the FBI, they're like, you know, um, yeah, you're too small of a case for us, right? They're going after the big 50 bucks and above, 100 bucks and above types of case, right? So, um, and then it's expensive. Right. You know, the, you know, when you when you lose good money, you're chasing bad money to go after good money. So, you know, uh, we w and we help save because it's essentially what we are is, you know, the analogy in the U.S. is ID theft recovery, but for crypto or uh, roadside assistance, but for crypto. Right. So when you're driving in your car and your your tire or engine breaks out, someone comes and fixes your car. That's what we do when your crypto gets lost. We provide you all the services that you would otherwise need to do to get started in, in recovering and provide you with a network of elite partners in, in specific instances in each cases. And of course, geographic jurisdictions to go after um, the perpetrators of who's stolen your crypto. Uh, you know, this, these services, 
even just for forensic evidence, will start at at least twenty thousand dollars. All right, and then once you go down that rabbit hole, and you're dealing with global law firms and getting court injunctions and litigation and ransomware negotiation or negotiation with the perpetrators, tracing of not only crypto assets but assets of the assets of the perpetrators. Now this it goes to over one hundred fifty thousand dollars. Okay, so um, what we're saying is just like a cyber insurance or just like a um, or just like a uh, health insurance policy turn this into a subscription right and this subscription basically will you know if if a breach were to happen then then um, you know you pay a fraction and you get all those services uh, for your specific case um, at a at a fraction of the price okay like less than 10 percent of a fraction of the price okay and then uh, you know and even as and as you know too if you run an exchange uh you know things like the travel rule and kyc aml rules it's globally going through the roof right so mika in europe and the sec and uh, and mas right now due to all the <laughs> you know uh terra luna and all that all the all the all the types of things is also going through the roof so you know for example you know um the the FT, FATF or call you know for example if you raised a Bitcoin fund or etc they might call you you know three months later and say why are you why are you taking money from a sanctioned entity now that person may have not been labeled as a sanctioned entity um, when you took the money but then you know they are labeled today and then you would also have to go and prove to the FATF uh, that that they're not a sanctioned entity so. What we provide in terms of documentations for, um, you know, the forensic evidence that's usable in the court of law and things like that, double as also regulatory compliance if you are running a, a crypto exchange. I, I'm in Dubai, and actually I met um, recently <laughs> one of uh, a, a very successful Bitcoin trader who who is being attacked by Finma, and he showed me um, he's a Swiss refugee, and he he was attacked by Finma, and he showed me that what Finma received as evidence was a Coinbase account that um, was photoshopped. They photoshopped wallet addresses and they photoshopped transactions on top of a Coinbase account, and they sent that to Finma to say, "Hey, this person is financing terrorism," and this you know so. He's gone through this whole ordeal now, where now he, you know, and I think he had to pay. He had to not only guarantee, he not he not not only had to guarantee how much money the, he was paid to Finma and etc. through all his trading and, and etc. But he also had to pay a fine. <laughs> now you don't, you've done nothing wrong, but you you're paying a fine. To, it's, it's like a close to two hundred thousand dollar fine to basically clean yourself, right? And that's not to say the emotional toll, the PR toll, that that's that someone who gets jealous at you um, would can paint on you quite easily, right? So this is something that you really need to like. I I think what's lacking as well is that you know this it's a de- you know blockchain is of course a decentralized concept, but trust is being centralized uh, through you know creating of different variable asset service providers and things like that. But and the third parties, the regulators who are supposed to be monitoring you, they actually don't understand what's going on or they don't have the capability to actually understand, um, you know, like, or they don't want to deep dive enough or t- to understand the root cause, right? So it is a bit of a wild west right now. And, and you know, it's good to have, you know, the third party, independent third parties that would basically lay to rest because at the end of the day, a blockchain is 100% transparent. So who are your typical customers? Are there Bitcoin businesses, crypto businesses, or crypto investors as well, like YPO members? Yeah, yeah. So that's a great question. We, we're starting with B2B. We, um, we've onboarded a few exchanges, a few custodial providers, um, some funds, uh, wallet as a service providers. And and at the end of the day, it's, it's like if you were to lose... Sort of, a touch word, right? If say someone just saw Bitcoin in your custodial or wallet and it went missing, who do they blame first? They blame you, right? Your your clients would blame you. They say, what do I need to do, et cetera, et cetera. And, 
and and basically you need to wash your face and if it's someone powerful enough they will go to the regulatory authorities and they'll paint the you know they put the black, black you know red paint on you okay <laughs> that that would put you in a terrible light so um as well as a lot of startups do not have the ability to deal with a lot of the customer service and and, and things like that and it's it's ultimately at the end of the day what happened to the crypto if it got lost and it's a and desirable position to be in. So that's also where we can come in and provide all that forensic evidence and say like, look, this was not the the choice, but also streamline someone on a way to um, getting, getting assets recovered. Also what people don't understand too, in terms of global regulatory um, movement is that now crypto in most jurisdictions is now recognized as property. So let's say for hypothetically, you steal $2 million worth of my crypto, hack it, et cetera. I trace it back to you. You say, it wasn't me. This is my crypto, X, Y, and Z. I can still liably go after, I can freeze money in your bank accounts and I can go after any property or other assets that you have of the same equivalent amount. So this is also something that um, people need to understand. If there is an H&I and uh... The H&I has invested about hundred thousand dollars in Bitcoin. Would he still be a client? Would CryptoLog be able to provide him some product or service, or is it still just Bitcoin and crypto companies and not Bitcoin crypto investors? Oh yeah, sorry, I, I didn't answer your question. You, so we we're going B two B right now, but we will, and then we want to go B two B to C. So we see it also as a partnership with our clients. That like, look. For example, crypto payments processor, the merchant, you know, like the merchants need to understand that, hey, my crypto being processed and being stored on the wallets is safe. Um, And if it were to be um, moved or stolen or whatever uh, on a wallet that I don't own the private keys on, uh, then I, you know, I, you know, at least there's some third party, third party accountability and tracing. That's not your organization, right? Um, So, uh, and then we we will we will launch BDC towards the um, second half of the year too. So yeah, we we want it for everyone, and also goes to the theme if you're a crypto investor investing into a crypto company or an ICO or etc. or a DAO or um, something. You know, you would want you would want the counterparty to be monitored. So we can also provide, you know, we could also provide that where maybe if a whole community is putting all their crypto into a DAO that that DAO is monitored and if something were to happen, you know, the the community can buy the type of insurance um, and basically um, do all the tracing forensics and, and things like that. So run me through a typical example, Roger. If there's a Bitcoin business, maybe a typical client of yours, uh, give a brief of the kind of business activity and then what they would come to you for, approximately how much they would pay and then what is the product that you service that you provide and in case of a typical hack where you've come actually into the picture and then what is the solution that you were able to provide and solve it so you know the audience has a kind of a more clear specific idea of the entire journey no 100 percent. so for example um let's say you're any type of virtual asset service provider okay let's say you are um, a, a wallet or a hedge fund or um, a, an exchange, you have crypto treasury. Number A is uh, like, first, let's monitor and protect your treasury. So what we would do is we'd offer not only the wallet screening services, if you don't already have them, um, but then we'd also offer um, transaction monitoring, which basically means we'll, be tra- we'll monitor all the r- transactions that is happening on that wallet. And if there's a risky transaction, we would notify you immediately. If the and let's say there was a risky transaction or, or something, you'd get an SMS or an email saying, Hey, did you authorize this transaction? Much like if your credit card, if someone swiped your credit card. In the past six months, <laughs> two people have swiped my credit card in two different places. So I've had two credit card replacements with two different banks. And what do you mean by wallet screening? This is also another great point, is that is that everyone What's also happening in KYC AML in the world is that if you are receiving crypto from an, from a wallet or sending crypto to a wallet, you will you should be screening that because if it's a sanctioned entity um, or linked to a sanctioned entity, 
that Bitcoin or crypto will be tainted and will be very hard for you to convert it into fiat one day. Okay, so that, that is a big trend that also, you know, the average Joe just does not understand right now. And it's going to, you know, vastly increase in the next two to three years. So screening that you're dealing with clean wallets or clean counterparties, okay, and providing that forensic evidence that it is indeed clean. Then the third, second is the transaction monitoring. So in the event of there's an authorized transaction or something were to happen, we would notify you and say a breach did happen, we would immediately begin the tracing. The um, So not only the tracing, the gathering of the forensic evidence, dealing with all the major VAS, Binance, Coinbase, Kraken, et cetera, et cetera, um, and blacklisting the wallets, okay? And saying, hey, like, look, if crypto gets here, it should be tagged as, as um, you know, suspicious and don't let it be converted into uh, fiat, okay? And then providing, you know, not only that, the legal opinion. So we, we separated the recovery process into stage one, two, and three. Stage one is getting the forensic evidence uh, verified by a global law firm that's usable in a court of law to get a court injunction. Okay. If you do not have this, you're nowhere. L let me just be clear with that. If you, if you don't have this, you can't go to the police. You can't go to the court. You can't go anywhere for anyone to help you because who's going to believe you, right? It's your words versus them. So it's a third party forensic evidence, that's stage one of the kind of protection we provide. Stage two is a continuous monitoring, tracing, private investigative services, negotiations, et cetera, et cetera, with the, with the perpetrator or where the crypto lands up and dealing with all the VAFs where, um, where, the, where, the, where the crypto lands up and basically telling them, Look, you need, you need to send it back, retrieve it. You need to basically, or negotiating with the counterparty. And you'd be, so one thing is also in the space is you don't, you know, the hack gets glorified, but then the recovery does not, right? So when, you know, $5 million goes missing and, you know, 4.9 comes back, no one talks about that at, at the end of the day. So there's a lot of crypto that's being recovered. And, you know, so pinpointing the perpetrator as, as fast as possible, and then basically saying, okay, um, helping negotiate, negotiate. And then if worse were to come to worst, then stage three is, okay, where is this person? You know, is he in Panama? Is he in Brazil or et cetera? Do we go after him, um, you know, in criminal? Do we go after him as a civil lawsuit? Do we, who do we use, right, <laughs> to, to, to go after this guy? Do we, will we need to use local debt collectors? Will we need to, you know, a whole vast array of different ways to get, to get the crypto? Now, the caveat to all this is that we don't guarantee any, re any recovery. So, and I'll be the first one saying, if your crypto lands up in North Korea or if it lands up in Russia, then I'm very sorry, right? But, but you know, I've, this crypto that's landed up in, you know, from New York to some gang in, in LA. And I'm saying to the person, like, why don't you just legally sue the guy? The de guy definitely has money. It's like, well, now the case is with the FBI. And if the case is with the FBI, then, um, you know, they, they're handling it. And then you would, and if you would go after them in a civil suit, you would give up the um, rights that the FBI has to go after them in a criminal investigative manner, right? And so, you know, understanding this whole whole kind of um, complicated maze <laughs> of who to deal with um, is, is is quite is, is 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 quite complicated. And then another thing I'd also like to touch on is that uh, is that you know, for example, you know, we have a case right now with with crypto insurance or crypto custodial insurance is that basically this evidence also doubles as evidence for you to provide to your insurer should, should crypto get lost. Okay, so um, hypothetically, I can't talk too much about the current case we're dealing with. Most custodial types of crypto insurance will only provide um, for the specie insurance if there was a hot... So basically how crypto insurance 
basically was developed was they took storage for gold vaults insurance and they turned it into a crypto insurance. So at the end of the day, it's like if you're using a BitGo or a Fireblocks or a Copper or whatever, if the software were to break, then yes, they're going to they're going to recover, right? The chances of that is very, very, very close to zero. Okay. <laughs> then, then the other type of insurance that they add on is a crypto crime insurance, which goes up to maximum I've seen in the markets is twenty million dollars. Okay, but let's say you do, you, let's say there was a hack for a hundred million dollars, right? To claim on the crypto insurance, you will still need all the forensic evidence that I provided, and if you don't do it right. The insurer will not help you. We, we're helping a client right now, and the insurer has listed three law firms that they say that they don't need to pay out a claim on. Okay, so we are fighting this tooth and nail <laughs> for 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 our for our client. So the other caveat to that is that if you are hacked for a hundred million dollars, and then the crypto insurer were to pay you out on the twenty million dollar claim, they have rights to the hundred million dollars too. So um, you know that's also a decision that anyone should that anyone should should make. It's also very hard, you know. So some of these, um, it's very hard to prove collusion in a hack. It's very hard to they only underwrite certain types of risks in crypto crime insurance, right? And it's mostly like collusion or or etc. Right? Um, and your 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 crypto had to be in a cold storage and X Y and Z. So there's a lot of fine print <laughs> that we've we've had to go through in helping some clients deal with the insurer and um and and, and, and such and so forth right and it's i hate to say it it's like financial it's, it's a lot of financial bullying yeah it's not like car insurance which in case your car gets into an accident you're definitely going to get the insurance it's a very new product there is a lot of fine print and the fine print, I think, is designed in a way to really take care of the insurance company because there's just so much surface attack and they want to minimize the surface attack for themselves. So it's not just insurance is insurance. If you lose your crypto, you're going to get it. Um, and I get that. Are you comfortable to talk about the pricing a little bit um, for a business? Oh, yeah. so, no, 100%. So, you know, for, for pricing, you look, we price per wallet per year. Um, and there's different stages of stage one, two, and three of of the coverages that you would want. So on a pricing standpoint, you know, for it could be as anywhere as low as fifty dollars per year to as high as you know two thousand dollars per wallet per year. But that also depends on what type of wallet you're covering and what type of stage of recovery uh, you want to recover. And you would only pay, you know, a lot of people. So we're not an insurance product. We're like a membership product, okay? That it's like you buy a membership to a country club and you use a tennis court or you use a golf course and, and things like that. So when you have when a breach was were to happen, you have rights to use our membership, uh, to use our recovery services, basically. And just like in insurance where there's, um, you know, a, an excess or a deductible, then you would pay... What we call a breach fee to to initiate those those um, services, and and that's the way we make it affordable to um, to a lot of startups and uh, and and VASPs as well. So it depends on how much coverage you want, and then we we would also work with our clients if they wanted to offer it as a B two B two C um, for up to stage one. So even if you wanted to do up up to stage one, we could make the the membership fees very very low. Um, to all your clients, and then if there were, if and you know, you uh, we can wholesale to you, or or you know, um, and you can sell it on, and 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 such and so forth. So I think there's a lot of opportunities in this in this realm. But ultimately, if you are a member, you will save over ninety percent uh, as a guiding line, as a guiding principle, um, over ninety percent of breach fees uh, if if something would happen, basically. Yeah, very different stage. Uh, of a membership than a country club experience, but no, absolutely. <laughs> and at the price points, Roger, that you're talking about, it's absolutely affordable even for a HNI or an investor to come to you and take, uh, you know, buy the services just for their own in investments. I mean, you keep 
you keep saying it's a B2B, but the price points you're talking about make sense almost as a B2C as well, at least for HNI investors. Isn't that the case? Yeah. No, 100%. So yeah, we will be releasing that later, uh, later in the year. And we, we, we definitely, um, you know, we, we're just looking for distribution and, and things right now. So if there's any YPOs out there who want to sell the membership onto the HNIs and, and things like that, you know, we're more than open to have, have those conversations. Sure. And what is the percentage of recovery? Is that possible for you to give like a single statistic out of all the customers that have come back to you in case of a breach? Uh, so, yeah, I, I wouldn't say, you know, it's hard to say right now. Um, it's hard to say. I can give you stats globally that the thing is of, you know, last year, um, maybe only 5% of crypto was recovered. But that's only because only 5% of the people can afford the services to to get the to get crypto recovered. So, you know, it's a big problem. You know, we're attacking a big problem. And we want to make it affordable to, for the average Joe to get crypto recovered at the end of the day, because it's, it's you know, say, well, only 5% is recovered, but only, you know, who's going to pay at least 50 grand to get, <laughs> to help get their crypto recovered at the end of the day. So, yeah. If, if my wallet gets hacked, okay, and I come to you, I, I know this is an oversimplified question, or you'll have to give an oversimplified answer, but if it does, what is... What should be my chances of recovery? What is it like? You know, one percent chance? Is it like much higher? Do I have a fifty percent chance of recovery when I come to you? Yeah, so that's a great question. So if you were to come after, uh, we also get a lot of post breach people who think, "Can you help us post hack?" And then I, I, I basically have to say to them, which is not nice, is that look, we only twenty thousand dollars, or we're not even going to consider going after it, but. If, if we can get a whole group of you together and you share the cost of similar victims. So we're actually going to do some work with Gasso, who are dealing with the pig butchering, the pig butchering a scandal, the romance scandals. Um, on, there's a lot of romance scandals on Tinder and, and a lot of dating apps. Um, so, and they're a nonprofit to, to help deal with people who've been, um, who, who've been victims to such and so forth. But it, it depends on time. So just to answer your question, so if you get hacked, it depends on time. Uh, the faster you act, the, the higher the probability is. If the crypto is at, at an exchange, so we've also had the case of, okay, crypto's been at an exchange, right? The exchange agreed with the police to freeze it, all right? But then because there's no legal pressure or, or legal opinion, saying that this is indeed my crypto, they could only freeze it for three months, right? So if they trace the crypto to exchange, et cetera, et cetera, and if it is your opinion, the, the exchange is not allowed to um, give up the KYC AML uh, information without a court injunction. So that's why, again, I stress is you need the evidence to get, it doesn't matter it's, 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 it's sad to say it doesn't matter what you do, but it matters who you do it with of what gets done, right? So if I've got a top global law firm that's gotten a court injunction and I've sent it to Binance, right? They will they will give up the KYC information, right? But if you have, you know, your two bit outfit on the side of the street saying, okay, we'll get all this done, and you send it to Binance, they're gonna say, who are you? <laughs> I'm sorry, that's the way the world works, right? It's unfortunate. But it is the way the world works. Yeah. Got it. Okay. Uh, and just since, uh, you know, I want to share the website. And just in case you want to kind of explain anything. So this is CryptoLock's website, right? And uh, yeah. I think there are solutions over here that you mentioned. I don't know if you want to kind of, you want me to go to any specific page or something. But in the solution, you have it for custodians and wallet providers for crypto funds and for crypto payment yeah. processors. So yeah, so we're going to be adding a lot more verticals um, soon. And um, you know, let's just go to wallets and wallets and custodians, basically. Is I, I think we're also at a time in the industry where, uh, where basically, you know, a lot of people need to wash their, wash their face or clean their face. 
And what we'll also do is, is similar to like um, Symantec or you know your SSL secure SOX layer, is that we we will also provide um, you know a digital certificate. So you can tell your users to say, hey, you know, like your crypto is being, don't, you don't need to trust us, okay? Um, but if shit were to hit the fan, your, your crypto is being monitored and, you know, you can actually initiate, initiate that on your behalf. So, you know, we want to make this as affordable as possible. Um, and we want to, as you said, get to the HNIs or even get to the average Joes uh, to to basically have this as part of a wallet service that says okay like if um, if things were to, if things were to happen then at least I've got somebody to talk to you know like and, and and at the end of the day is you know we know all the guys in crypto insurance now too is that no you know not your private keys not your crypto and frankly speaking an insurance provider will only provide insurance if they control the private keys. Right. So um, we're, we're not, you know, like we don't want your, we don't need your private keys or et cetera, your wallet, but have it monitored. You know, I, I, I say to people, anyone with over $30,000 in a wallet should at least, at least have stage one service of our um, st stage one protection of our service. Yeah. And then when, you know, there is a, uh, there's a link like your call to action is to book a demo. What is it that you, that you yeah. Do in the demo, like what's the normally the demo about? It's this, it's the wallet screening and the transaction monitoring service. That's what you kind of show at the at least in the stage one. Yeah, so we'll do we also show various example reports that you would get. Um, you know, we can also walk through uh, you know, because um, we also what's great is that we've we're built on top of the whole uh, whole policy doc platform is that basically we can also white label our, our product too. So let's say Coinbase wanted to create their own Coinbase protection product. You can, we can provide a whole white label, you know, solution branded under your name, um, that, that too. So, you know, I, I'd say we're still um, like, yeah, you know, we, 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 we're getting, we've got quite a few <laughs> requests, but we also are still tailoring and figuring out. So, I appreciate all the questions on our kind of go to market and our business strategy and, and things like that. So we, we, you know, we, we are, we are going to get to that whole, you know, I guess Salesforce experience where it's like X, Y, and Z. And we can also tailor um, different plans for you to say like, look, you know, if you want, um, you know, uh, a lower membership fee or, and a higher breach fee, you know, it's, it's like a sliding scale basically. So depending on how many users you have, what type of requests you get, uh, X, Y, and Z. You know, we, you know, we, we're flexible right now at this moment, but I can't guarantee we'll be flexible forever. Any comments on the Bitcoin price? Oh, you know, I, I think it's good value. <laughs> if you think it's going to be a million dollars, it's, it's, yeah. it's, it's, a, it's a good value. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Your thoughts? It's a typical Bitcoin maxi response. Um, no, yeah, I think Bitcoin is cyclical like any other asset. Uh, yeah. And I think in the cycle, I don't think it's like absolute crazy, insane fear like we were uh, maybe two, three months yeah. back, you know, at the height of the FTX uh, contagion. So I think it's kind of step recovered from that. So I think if it's on a scale of one to five where one is extreme fear, I think it's about two. But then again, anything below three is good value. So yeah, I agree. Yeah, yeah, I, and at the same time, is what's interesting is that the price is recovering and the whole world is crashing, right? <laughs> so so yeah. that's that's kind of um, yeah. My my main thesis is like the more feral governments behave, the better the Bitcoin price does. So uh, and that's you know if you take out all the leverage, so a lot of leverage was taken out the system, and this is this is like the the you know, the, the test in the pudding sometimes, you know, you testing you the waters the right now. Yeah. Well, not all of it, but there's always going to be leverage in the system, right? But leverage is more expensive these days. Interest rates are going higher. Um, so, you know, people who are going to look for this assets now are there's maybe there's gold alternative types of guys who, who are like, well, you know, 
you know, where's the U.S. market? Where's the Chinese market? Are we going to go to war? The U.S. just sent more ships to the Pacific, um, West Pacific Islands, Russia, Ukraine. You know, I, I grew up in South Africa. The whole the, the government's failed in South Africa, right? So, like, where do we put our faith in right now? Oh, great. Roger, this has been a long conversation. I actually thought that we are going to talk about this for like 30 minutes or something. This is fantastic. Yeah, likewise. Super interesting. Yeah. <laughs> um, and when we're in Singapore, we should, uh, when I'm in Singapore, I'll, I'll look you, we should meet up and get, grab a drink, man. I think we share, Absolutely. you know, yeah. I, I'm always wary about, you know, different uh, things, but I, I, you know, always, always great to meet another, not only YPO, but another Bitcoin maximalist and uh, <laughs> lot, lot to discuss. Yeah. yeah. No, absolutely. I, I wish we could have done this podcast face to face because that's always a different experience. But still, thanks for coming over. We'll definitely catch up um, in Singapore. Tell, tell me, how can people find you and pay, uh, find CryptoLock? Yeah, look, uh, go to CryptoLock.ai. Um, you know, Roger, uh, Roger at uh, CryptoLock.ai is my email. So um, more than welcome to reach out. Uh, if there's any things we can help with, please let us know. You know, yeah. Roger, thanks for doing this and thanks for coming on 21 Towers. Thanks for, hey, thanks so much for your time and thanks for reaching out again. I really appreciate it. And um, yeah, hope to, we'll, we'll definitely be keeping in touch anyway. So yeah.